IST Row proudly presents lengthier, deeper, more complex. A panel discussion, a panel to discuss the performance of the realistic outlook in art and its potential for expression with the incomparable Katarina Jeb and Michelle Lamy, moderated by Dan Thau. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're missing one of our speakers. I saw people. She just has to put her sweater on. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here today with you in Rome and uh, to be back at the Istanbul Festival. It's a, a project that I believe very strongly in and that I've been a part of a few years in a row and uh, have watched grow and change and it's, it's really a a very interesting beast, and it's a, a project that provokes many different encounters between different disciplines and different people from different places, and now to bring that to Rome is very exciting as well because it just brings a whole other layer to, to the entire idea of mixing cinema, art, fashion, music, and all of the incredible talks we've already heard today. And, um, I'm very lucky to be here with, with Katerina and Michelle, two women who I respect greatly and for me form a vital part of the fabric of what I think creativity in Paris is today and, and they, they both have a reach into the, the creative realms that's, that is much further than, than Paris and, uh, and to sit here with them today I've, I've had to reflect on my own relationship with them over the years as I've grown in, uh, into my role. I'm a, I'm a magazine editor and uh, a journalist and I've had the opportunity to work on uh, many projects with them and please welcome Michelle to the stage. <clears throat> and uh, with this topic, which is of course a potent and controversial one, I had to think back to the first time I met and, uh, and worked with uh, both Katerina and Michelle and, and firstly I'll, I'll start with Michelle because I, uh, I don't know if she'll even remember specifically interviewing uh, when I interviewed you and Rick for Candy Magazine. It was seven years ago and Michelle invited me over for breakfast on a Sunday morning to the Palais Bourbon. And uh, I guess I was nervous. I was young. I hadn't met either of them before. And she was so sweet that she asked me if I wanted to have, to have some eggs for breakfast. So she cooked me some eggs. And uh, we were sitting in the, in the back uh, living room next to the kitchen and Michelle opened a bottle of champagne at about 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. And uh, she poured three glasses of champagne and uh, the interview started and it was for Candy Magazine, which is a, which is a magazine, it's called a transversal style magazine. It's really about... Yeah, we can talk room. about uh, Candy because uh, that was something interesting with Rick and me growing a beard what I'm supposed to be. Exactly. <laughs> so the shoot that was accompanied this story was actually, um, it was a bit of a gender fuck. The idea was uh, Rick with uh, beautiful long eyelashes and Michelle with a, with a, a, man's, uh, with a man's beard and moustache. And, um, and it, was a really, uh, it was a really fun and beautiful shoot. But as the interview went on, I was sitting there talking to them, asking them many, many questions drinking my glass of champagne and uh, getting slowly more loose and flexible and comfortable with the interview as it went on. And by the time I left, uh, about two hours later, I realized that neither of them drink alcohol and neither of them have touched their glasses of champagne. So Michelle had just set me up for my interview and I, and I thought that was a, a funny way to start today's chat about self-expression, about identity and about... Um, about what we perceive in other people and the way that we're able to to actually 
create art and create moments in art and use emotions rather than necessarily facts and how those two things interact. Um, because I think today one cannot really exist without the other because we have such access to facts that we are actually in a, in a space where it's our personal interests and obsessions and our, that, that actually allow us to seek out the facts that we want. And, um, you know what, you are too... This is not talking about. You are too intellectual for us. <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Nami to, I quite no, to no, kick off with these ladies, I'd like to... Um, Can you hear it? ...to is show it? you some of their work. And, uh, testing, 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 one, two. We'll be seeing... Um, some of uh, Katerina's pho photography and, and digital scans uh, coming through on the, on the slideshow behind us. And um, I think it's interesting to, uh, to ask you first, Katerina, um, as, as an artist and photographer, you have uh, a trajectory that's led you to Los Angeles, a place that's very dear to uh, Michelle's heart as well, and now both finding yourselves in Paris. And um, if you could just explain the way that you actually take, create images, because it's not a traditional start or sense of photography in, in any way. Um, I use a scanner. Is that working? Can you hear me? Um, I had an accident. I don't really want to make such a big deal about that, but it was primarily the reason um, that I couldn't hold a camera. And I was quite young. I was probably 27. And I couldn't physically hold a camera. And before, I'd been a sort of experimental photographer. And so I used, when I knew I couldn't hold a camera, naturally, I started looking at ways that I could create images, make works without using a camera. And in a sort of haphazard way, I came across this big uh, photocopy machine. And I started making photocopies of my friends' clothes or myself or whatever things interested me. And it was a completely sort of lucky, natural device for me to create images. And so it was probably 25 years ago. No, maybe longer. And so I used the scanner, the photocopier, machines. It could be anything, really. I mean, that's the name of of the object, but I found that I didn't have to use a camera and I could be free and creative as, as, I, as I am now. And uh, in that process of composing these images, of course, you have really moved to a different level and, and kind of created this idea of composite images as well as some of the first ones that we're seeing on the, uh, above us are actually all single images, but um, what's actually very potent in your work as well is, uh, is the some way that you, yeah, some of them are indeed photographs, um, and also link back to some of the projects uh, in your earlier work related to, um, sex dolls. to sex dolls. Sex dolls. Um, and uh, I, w I was wondering how that sort of composition process works for you because you're actually taking different parts of the body, different parts of an object and recreating it and reconstituting, reconstituting it actually to, um, and as such, it becomes something else. It's not planned. I think that the natural creative expression is usually not planned and we just unravel it out of ourselves because if we're sort of premeditated, it's one medium, it's one way to express, just to calculate and plan and conceive. And then there's another animal like me where I'm probably incapable of planning or deciding before what I'll do. I very much like to be put on the spot to see what is spontaneously there. Um, so all these things that you see, this eclectic phenomena is just from a sort of childlike attraction to these various objects, subjects. It's not, it's not planned. It's very much the opposite. And uh, how has your personal identity actually 
come up into your work th over the years? Because I know that there are certain images that are quite important to your canon, let's say, that are actually of yourself and there are different times of your own life that you've documented. How often and why and, and when do you feel that you can be your own subject these days or ever? Gosh, I think being creative is usually, it's autobiographical and you're just taking an idea that you have there and then and manifesting it onto a piece of paper or film or music. I don't think it's all personal. It can only be personal. I, I don't, I can't see it another way. But in terms of putting yourself, let's say, on the scan or in front of oh, the camera? Me. Well, maybe there was no one around, so I had to scan myself. Or maybe um, if I was the subject for a few years of my own work, which I'm not very often now, I'm still the subject of my own work because my mind is creating the work. So it's still flowing in a, a natural way. And Michelle, how do you feel about sometimes being the catalyst for work and then being turned on as the subject as well? But I was just thinking more about uh, Katrina, the Jeb walk, because it's, uh, we don't know each other for so long, but long enough. And I think that uh, uh, she's really a great artist and there is this feminine side of showing the world that I love about her. And then personally, I think uh, she turned my schizophrenia into art. From then on, I'm moving on. It is actually, yeah. it's really incredible to actually have you both here together because there is some really incredibly strong links to your aesthetic journeys, I think, that it may be not be so evident straight away um, mm. that, I, that really fascinate me. And I think that uh, it's something about your world, Michelle, as well, that um, I think is sometimes misunderstood uh, in, in terms of how interested you are and in a more classical side of history and aesthetics. And I think that's also true for, for Katarina, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like particularly in, uh, in many of your projects, Michelle, there's this clash of brutalism and things that are much more Baroque and classical. Um, and it's something that, that Rick talks about as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, to see the subject matter of Katarina's photographs and also the things that, that you are making in, in the world of furniture and objects and sort of you know, working with these very luxurious or even very humble materials as well and creating these quite monumental projects. Um, and then to see that uh, the way that Katarina would work with this very dry, gray background yet to be scanning extremely precious objects. Maybe they're from museum collections. Um, a particular project that I'm a huge fan of is uh, the work that Katerina has done on the archives of Balthus, the painter, which is interesting as well in the sense that it's a portrait of someone who's no longer living through their objects, whereas many of your other works, which we'll, some of which we'll see later, and one of which is of Michel, uh, is very much of, of the living body. Yeah, but what is great about her is, uh, and we could see like this picture of uh, Christine, that's somebody we have in common, and uh, translating it, it says everything is going to be the ad for Christine at the Barbican, but uh, we can, what I'm the most interested in her is the way she decomposed the body and put it together in a way that seemed to be the real way it is, but then there is always something different that shows up, and I think she's doing a lot with, uh, with the body, because you talk about the object and the museum, but she's putting asses and tits in the museum, and uh, that's this part, I think, right now we are showing Chanel, but, but let's look at uh, what he did my portrait and Christine, and I think this is what I think is Post-truth, no, it's not. Absolutely. Because that's what I thought she belonged there. It's quite secretive, though. There's a whole body of my work that I never put on the internet, my work. I don't really 
I don't, I'm a little bit reticent about putting too much out there. And so I hide things, I squirrel things and keep them. And then one day they'll naturally give birth into the cyberland or physical manifesto. Um, but the body, the human body, I view as a sacred, beautiful, noble truth. And so if I do, if I make studies of the body, I, I really think it's, um, it's a, a very, um, gosh, I can't... No, but you do, you do I think on the body. Look at this uh, uh, campaign that you did for those uh, man-made diamonds with oh. Dover Street. So where did she put it? On the ass. In but that's, not, that's a child it like a right. No, but that's what we are talking images, about yeah. now because mm. the, you are doing your sorts of other things. So yeah. that's the way to say the truth with mm. something yeah. that is Emotional. starting another truth but bring the emotion. So the fact that when she scan a body, she go with pieces, from pieces. It's not like that one scan. So then she is stopping certainly in some places that are different and putting it together. So I think it's a process of uh, recreating your own world, what uh, I appreciate. And even if it's for something that is, uh, where is art, where is advertising, where this, there is no difference, it's not important. But that's why I think what's this very much of the now in the process she is using. And in terms of the portrait, the scanned portrait, it's, it's a very particular process. It's very much, uh, it's quite confronting for the, for the subject as, as much as it is for you. It's in extremely intimate. Uh, and as such, you know, you're, I mean, I've seen you, I mean, I've seen you actually taking a portrait of Delphina and to see that process of the face being squished into a scanner, you know, it's, it's very, very much, uh, I mean, it's claustrophobic, it's, it's really, um, it's sort of stripped bare, let's say, and then the results give this negative, this sort of feeling of negative space as well, because the scanner does strip away anything else, yet it's almost about that incredible closeness and this really somewhat warped idea of a person's face as well from time to time because of what it picks up. Could you sort of explain your, the relationship with, to, with whether you're trying to truly sort of extract one expression from the person or what, what are you exactly trying to capture each time and, and what are, how does the final image kind of come to be? Well, it's slightly medical. I think the noise, there's a sound that's quite ominous. The glass that is really one millimeter from the face of the subject is already quite uh, imposing. And sometimes I can make the portrait in 20 scans, sometimes 50, it, it takes a long time. Sometimes there's no saying how long it may take. I will go as long as I can until I sort of see a beautiful image or a haunting image that pleases me and hopefully the subject. And it's an imprint. It's a document, an imprint. It's historical. It's like a photograph without using a camera. But it seems because the subject is so close to the scanner and the scanner is not me and it's not a, it, it's not, it's, a three, it's a triptych, it's a relationship between me, the subject, and the scanner. So it's a work that requires three, four things, ele electricity, it's dry image making, the subject, me, and the machine. Mm. It's an, a different medium. I think that people think it's a bit gimmicky if you say, oh, she scans people, they could say, Oh gosh, what's that? That's like really, it's so easy. Well, it is easy, anyone could do it. We could do a, a workshop now and I could show you all how to do it. Yeah. But there's 
the actual actuality of just doing it, and then there's making it, trying to make it poetic. Yeah, but it's the way that you put it together afterwards, because it's not only the, the making, and it after you have, and you can twist the t what the person is, this, or the rest of the body. That's why it's interesting, because you reconstruct something, thinking, well, you are going to show something of them. It's not the fact that, beside the fact they were under a machine. I think that's what is the art. Well, maybe that's personal taste and architecture and having a sense of form and, you know, composition. Um, but that is haphazard, and that's the creative process. It's just letting it all sort of fall into place. You can't plan. And at that point, I think the, the choice of subject becomes extremely important yeah. too, and I'm, I'm also curious as to the way you navigate your own work in, inside contemporary and modern art history of photographic portraiture as well, because something we've been talking about over the last few days as well is the various, let's say, channels of types of people that you've, that you've worked with and, and worked on. And, um, the women in particular that you've chosen to photograph, I, I remember very well being faced with one particular room at your exhibition in Arles um, and being faced with a, an incredibly diverse group of strong women that could today be considered somewhat of a true and imagined ar aristocracy of, of today. And there were princesses and there were there was, I believe there was Michelle, and there was uh, all sorts of different faces from theater and, and music and, and fashion and different worlds that, that you had chosen. And I think that that is a testament to your worldview and the characters that you see in these women that you, you want to emphasize and to recreate and to also immortalize as one avenue of your work. But I think as what's interesting is that in recent times and in particular with portraits like that of Christine which we will we will see shortly or maybe I can try and skip forward and find them so that we're there this is actually this one is an early work that's a self portrait um, yeah 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 but here we have um, an amazing collage where Til there is Tilda's face and and who else is in in this image Excuse yeah. me. Sorry. Uh, French paintings from the Louvre taken with an analog camera, yeah. and then a few months of photo montage where I layered scans and all different imagery one on top of the other, and then uncovering. I mean, if we went, if we put this file into Photoshop, there's probably like 36 calc layers. Yeah. And then in the middle of it that you don't see, I took it out, there's. Um, Delacroix, you know the famous painting of, um, um, it escapes me. Anyway, it's a few months of work and it, it's the Jericho rafts of the Meduse underneath. It was a carpet, but it, it um, six meters large work. What was the question? Yeah. So no, but that's what I was suggesting, here is Michelle. Is. What, I was, what I was get getting at is that there is sort of a duality into your work that you're also looking for the freaks, you're also looking for the avant-garde, for the underdogs as well as, as this kind of mo much more classical idea of, of, portraiture of portraiture of classical aristocracy and people that are very much used to being celebrated for old world values and now there's you're sort of bridging that and I think images of Michelle and, and Christine mm -hmm. This is it's Christine. counterculture. Yes, it's exactly. Really so, yeah. sort of looking at these different sides of your own interests and personality in your work. I think I, I, I relate more to mavericks, to people who are a little bit counterculture than famous. I mean, I have taken pictures of, of famous people. I like a little bit more the underground. I think I naturally am attracted more to 
people who aren't so known, who are quite out there. Um, so those are selfish works that I make for myself. Yeah. Um, and then there are other works that, yeah. oh, yeah. Um, she's um, the subject of the Lucian Freud painting that sold for 56 million. Um, and this is her 20 years later, lying on her bed. Um, I took the bed out though. I did scan the bed and okay. then I took it out. And there she is, um, a very interesting character. Yeah. Invited by you. Indeed, yes, that's a project we did together recently. And um, yes, that there is that sort of meta nature to a lot of your work because you are referencing your own interests and obsessions from the past and a lot of the a lot of the uh, other pieces that we've been seeing i'm going to go backwards now um there are documents there are relics there are all sorts of natural phenomena as well that are important to to your work and um that's that in itself is actually the way that you're building your own mark and your own history as your body of work you don't it's not um it's it's not planned, as we, as I said before. It's something that just, if you're living your life, it just would propose itself. These subjects, they just, if you're open and you're sensitive, you meet the right people, you find the right objects in the flea market. You, it's just sort of, the signs are all there. You just have to be awake. And that's a very, that's the way you work too, isn't it, Michelle? Uh, I don't know, I don't know. But you know, I'm here because I wanted to be with her and she asked me to. And I think it's interesting that I tried to push her and you to say how this is the way that I thought was in the theme of the story because I'm here, I'm here because I'm going to say something a little later that I've, uh, that I have to run away to sort of put in my head and leave you with her. And uh, <laughs> she dragged me in and I'm very happy and about, uh, I really think it's all about her because if you want to make me start, I said it all. She put into heart what perhaps you can think into is schizophrenia for me and I walk with people, I walk with a lot of other people, and we are going to see a little later what I'm doing with those Lavasca people. So, thank you, I'm going. It's all you. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. <laughs> On that note, I would like to hear your opinion on, on Michelle's world because I feel like, you know, I've, I've said a little already and um, I'm it's very... much about me. It's more about her. I mean, if we move away from, from your work in the past, and perhaps you can tell us about how you two met and, and have become friends because it is, as she said, a recent, a, a recent friendship. But um, Michelle's life has been incredibly rich and varied with... with various careers, various hats, from life in LA to, to Paris, and uh, of course working alongside Rick Owens. She had her own label before. Rick, uh, Rick was even on the radar, and she was creating the kind of clothes that were the forerunners to what, what he has turned into a global business with her at his side. And uh, she has continued to grow and create incredible projects on the side of that from furniture to to jewelry to of course her own personage which is in itself um a life's work and uh f what does she what does she represent to you um she's a triumph of being human i say that she's um the world's a better place that lamy exists she's a liberator She's a messenger, she's free, she's generous, highly creative, but doesn't actually, hasn't, isn't always labeled as an artist, but she indeed is. Um, I think you could think in your life, you meet, you have several 
um, belle rencontre. You have several meetings with people that can make your life richer. And that meeting Lamy is whoever meets her, it's definitely before and after that she enriches your life in, in a really light and deep way. Um, and it makes you feel, she being in your life makes you feel that you belong more. Because she, it's not just one type of person that she befriends. She has many, uh, it's very eclectic. It, there can be lawyers, activists, artists, cooks, boxers, uh, rich people, poor people, medium. It, it's very democratic, it's very fair. Her universe is very fair. And do you think if we're talking about this this topic that the idea of stereotypes is one thing that self-expression in the in a post-truth world is really about breaking those and about not even allowing them to exist in your in your universe. And I think Michelle is really a truly singular entity in our in our world. And I, she's also bridged many different generations. And of course, there are people of her age and, and older who can tell amazing stories today. Um, but she's continuing to live and to grow into, let's say, this post-truth world. She's really, truly not just engaged with things of, of her own past, but she's you know, embraced the digital world. She is continually chasing art fairs and design projects and the possibility, cultural possibilities that our planet has to, has to offer. And uh, it's truly, it really is very, very impressive. And it, at the same time, this I, I guess this idea of the of the female artist as well, and the and the um, the strong woman, has had many, uh, let's say, uh, shortcomings over the over his over the, the last century because it was it's so often believed that one cannot be all of those things and be a mother, for example, or not be all of those things and have a family and, and, a, and a life. And, and she's done all of those things. And I think you as, you as well are an example of, of, of a juggler and, uh, and as you said, a kaleidoscopic life where, wherein your, your art allows you to exist on all those different levels and to, and to have to, and to have that driving force to continue to create whilst, and not just at the same time, not just dedicating yourself solely to that, but to have a very rich scope of, of, uh, of, of things to do. What's your question? No, it's just, I think it's more about um, what do you see that in, in yeah, yourself yeah. and okay. in her and... and I think um, Lamy and other strong, amazing women like that are poster girls <laughs> advocates for, or the kind of catalysts for young women and men to be free, to express themselves, to not be put inside a square box, to be like a tree that grows and grows, that certain individuals are leaders and they show us a, a way forward not to be xenophobic, not to be um, scared to talk here. I, I'm scared to talk in public. It's not something I naturally do, but I'm doing it because I think it's important to try to do things that you are scared of. And she's the kind of friend that would sort of, would inspire you to be a better version of yourself every day. And so if creativity can, if creativity can do anything, it should, be expansive. It should allow us to expand our mind and our our thinking and our the way we live. As we continue to look through some of the images, um, it would be great to if you could explain a couple of them to us, as um, they may oh, ex shoot. they may appear yeah. random, as you said, oh, and they oh. may be elements from flea, flea markets oh. and. And it uh, doesn't really matter where you found some of them because, as I said, some of them could be in prestigious museum collections or others could be things you found 
um, on the street, but um, how do you choose an object and, and why does it, what is the inherent importance in them for you to photograph them uh, just as a person is I think sometimes the object chooses me and sometimes I choose the object. Like these shoes from Jean-Paul II, Pope Jean-Paul II, uh, they're in the Vatican and I made that scan. It's several scans actually, it's not just one, it's trickery. Um, in the Vatican, last, not last year, the year before, for the Met. Um, that's that's a self-portrait in a photo booth in Paris in 1989. Um, that's a carnivore, it's called um, Ne Panthers. It's um, a carnivorous plant from uh, an exhibition I made about <laughs> carnivores. That's um, an object encased inside this it's called um, a real doll. It's a silicone and steel sex doll in a factory in San Diego in 1999. Um, inside is a doll. When you crack open the mold, there's a doll which is in the slideshow. You can find it if you press. What, That's life size. What drew you to that project of, of the sex dolls? Because it's intrigue. I thought I, if I take photographic projects, I, it's quite, usually it's quite um, anthropological. I like to s find phenomena that I am weirded out, like sort of makes me unnerved. And so I called this, I heard about this doll called Real Doll that people buy and have sex with. And I called the factory and I said, can I come and spend a few days there? So I spent a few days in this factory photographing these dolls um, for my own pleasure. Now, that's a hairbrush for an exhibition about hair made by um, two girls called Bless. It's like a surrealist object. And um, could you tell us also a little bit more about your work with video? Because um, it's something that has a more or less sporad sporadic yeah, it's more uh, spontaneous, yeah. uh, appearance um, in, your, in your portfolio of work. And uh, the way you treat video is, to video me, quite is, intriguing. Um, really complicated, difficult medium because editing is just the most overwhelming fear of feeling of dread. Editing a video is really hard and I think I find that I could only do one a year. I find them too difficult. It's okay filming, that's easy, but actually putting things together to make sense, it's very difficult. But in, as well, your videos don't always make sense as None immediately. None of them make sense. No. They don't make any sense, mm. my videos. They make sense to me um, because I don't, I like things that don't make sense. I'm attracted to things that are nonsensical. I'm attracted to abstract literature or modernism. I, I don't really, I like things that are a little bit strange. So my videos are a little bit not always coherent. Is that also the w reason that you are able to incorporate women and characters in your videos who sometimes have a perception to be entirely other in, uh, in the popular sphere? People like Marissa Berenson or Kylie Minogue, for example, who you have you know, fostered deep relationships with and have been able to film and to capture sides of them that are very intimate, abstract, strange. There are sort of, I, I remember the perfume ads that you made for Comme des Garçons uh, with the various women, Tilda Swinton included, with an element of nonsense and almost entirely simulated realities that you made where you were creating fake advertising for fake products that were just People really quite and disconcerting and, and brilliant, but there you go, they were not real at all. That was a way of having fun. That was really fun. 
was satire. It was sort of mocking the system of advertising, which I do sometimes. Um, but it can get you into trouble too. I mean, people generally wouldn't call me for advertising because they think I'm a troublemaker. So that sort of effectively put me out of a lot of work that I could have made, in, but it doesn't matter, it's fine. It is a space that uh, we were discussing earlier. It's a, it's a difficult construct to be working in some of the subject matter that you are working in, which does involve fashion and does involve all sorts of different uh, moving parts that are at times commercially driven art and other times personal work. And you were saying that earlier you don't see a distinction between the two, which I find very interesting in this time where everybody is tackling that whole idea of, of uh, cannibalism between fashion and art, where there's an, a very, very strong bond between the two right now, yet it's, it's, very, uh, it's very fragile. If you're making a work, it could be for a gallery or a festival or a museum, or it could be for um, a laboratory-made diamond company or perfume or whatever, shoes. It's from the same headspace, so why would it be different if it's going to be in a, online on a YouTube channel for shoes or if it's in a museum shown a telegram of Marcel Duchamp? It's the same attitude. I can't see a difference between sh making a work for yourself and making a work for Comme des Garçons Perfume. There's no difference really, except if you have a really uptight client that makes you do something you don't want to do, in which case you leave the building and you don't do it. I try not to work with people that don't truly understand what I'm trying to do. So I'm really probably quite lucky that I, I work with people who let me be quite free. Have you ever had instances in which things haven't worked out and you've had to cut the cord or be, just decide to be true to yourself and, or ever just mm -hmm. put your foot down and, and told them it's my way or the highway? Yeah, there's been screaming carryings on, like little films that I've made where I've included women with veils, you know, on the Champs-Élysées, Muslim women, and they say, take them out, and I say, no, I'm not taking them out, and then I stop fighting, saying, go there, see what's happening on the Champs-Élysées, see who the people are, I'm not taking them out. And I will fight for what I believe in to be the truth of making a work. I don't roll over and just say, okay. I'm, I'm quite clear about what I want, what I see, not what I want necessarily, what the energy of the project wants, what the creative force wants. It's not even me. I think most creative people would agree that creativity is something borrowed. It's just something that's flowing through you for a time, and then it leaves, and then it comes back. And then, if you're lucky, it visits you over and over again. And, and it's just you're sort of a conduit. Can I say that? For, for a big message coming from somewhere that is that you make something out of that message, if you can. And with that idea of your somewhat small existence that you, we were talking about earlier, you were talking about this idea that the difference between you and I is that my view is purposefully extremely broad, and whereas yours is purposefully, perfect, purposefully extremely f laser focused on specific things that you're working on and, and studying and, and uh, are obsessing about. And uh, quite often they lead you into, into the past and into your heroes and into, as you said, literature and, and art history. What are your thoughts on living like that in this era where everything is moving so fast? Um, I, I do have the impression that today we are, and rightly so, celebrating 
people like yourself who are remaining extremely true to a specific ideal, who are not, who are steadfast in their beliefs in their art practice and are not potentially adapting to the needs of the internet. I mean, you mentioned that you rarely are publishing all of your work online, that there is, you know, some things floating around, but other museum works and, and other projects, for example, that will never make it onto the internet, and, and, you, and that's quite a purposeful choice for you. I mean, I know that you don't like to share your work before it's finished, you know, there are a lot of uh, things that you hold quite tightly and dearly to yourself. I know that, you know, you're not a big Instagram person or anything like that as well, and I, I'm curious as to your thoughts on if, firstly, if you have any struggles living and working like that today, if you think it holds you back in any way? And secondly, do you think that in maybe 20, 30, 40 years, do you think artists and, uh, and historians will be looking back at 2019 or the, the, first of the start of the 21st century in the same way that we celebrate the incredible advances of the 20th century? Or do you think that we're in a sort of uh, a world of appropriation now? Um, I think everybody, myself included, we, we do things to survive, to exist every day, to try and have pleasure, to try and get through the day in the best possible scenario. Um, if the digital, the, if technology helps you to have a better day, great. If you don't need it to have a better day, that's, all, that's fine. Everybody adopts and adapts themselves according to what they need as a human being every day. I don't need what you need. I don't need to go to exhibitions. I don't need to, uh, there's a lot of things I don't need to do. I could probably, if you put me to live in an Amish village, I could probably be okay. Um, I'd say that I'm atypical, but that's fine. Everyone should live the best way that they can live and get to, to prosper and blossom. So the digital revolution, it's, um, it's whatever you want it to be. It's your truth. It's your way of expressing what you want to express. In, the, you know, what was it, Guy Debord, he said, um, I wanted to speak the beautiful language of my century, which I think is a very, what we should try to do, maybe, with or without the internet, with our iPhones. There's an amazing, um, everyone should read it. It's in the New Yorker, 2018, April edition. And it's this neuro, he's, um, a philosopher and a cognitive scientist. He's called Andy Clark, and it's um, an essay about the expansive mind. And he's, he is very forgiving. He has an idea that if man invented something, the iPhone, the knife and fork, a notebook, that it's part of his mind. And so the mind is, is constantly expanding and whatever we need to make our mind function is perfectly fine. Are you worried at all that this idea of the speed of information and the amount of information that we consume today allows for and compensates, compensates for a lack of depth of of discovery and a lack of, de lack of depth of investigation into, into things. We were, we were speaking about it earlier, about the idea of gleaning and the idea of, yeah. of experience and the belief that we can flick through Instagram stories and believe we've been somewhere and believe we've seen somebody and something and, and that believe that we actually know what happened at a concert or we believe what we understood what somebody did last night, or we can understand, we believe that we've, uh, we've been somewhere nearly, but in fact we've just seen 10 seconds or a still image of it and not lived any of it, any of it at all. It's a difficult question to answer. I think, um, 
has that quote, uh, everything is permitted, nothing is true, about truth in general. It's, people are deeper than we think. I think that we often dumb down the human race and we say that humans are superficial or they're, you know, the Kardashian era. But I think most human beings who watch that kind of phenomena do so in a darkly macabre fascination, knowing that they themselves have got a much deeper reservoir of consciousness than the thing that they are looking at. But who, how do we know, I mean, the thing that we're looking at, what's true anyway? Um, it's, it's a very complex subject. Photography, it, it, everything's a trick. What I do is trickery. Sometimes there's an image that is like many images together, you would believe it's one and it's not. So everything could be a screen. Everything is just a projection of reality. Who knows what is, you know, that Mayan kind of thing about reality is just a projection. We can't take it too seriously. Maybe, Maybe we have to be a little bit more um, less judgmental about what we see and just have it as a natural sort of language of our century. I guess what's also very interesting there is the sort of the assimilation of the physical and the digital augmentation too of the body. We were also discussing this idea of, of Botox and of body manipulation, which is as well coming to your work over the years, with, whether it's lips or breasts or the sex dolls and this idea of uh, femininity and, and various expressions of it. Um, and you had a wonderful anecdote about, about Botox that you shared with me yesterday. Oh yeah, the Andy Clark and the New Yorker, the, one, the expanded mind. It's not in the New Yorker article, but it's online in a film, an interview he gave. And he said, um, that he um, they made a test and that was a really good example of this test about the mind and emotion and the emotional response was that in somebody who's had Botox you can tell the, the woman or the man something that would naturally evoke, provoke an emotional, physical emotional response and they can't have the response the way that you would or I would because there's a time delay, not only in the mind, but physically. I mean, that's a little bit mind-blowing, even as a concept for me, but do you understand what I mean? It's a head fuck. It's like, oh, gosh, I, and there's a, another drug that does the opposite, that would make the reaction hyper, the opposite of, you can see the film, it's So I just wanted to have that as a last little note for today and then um, in the spirit of the week of the, the weekend I would like to ask if anyone has any questions uh, for Katarina because uh, I mean question time should be any time during these uh, these talks. Does anyone have anything to, to ask at all? Perhaps. Mike, please. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> oh gosh, sorry. Um, no, I haven't tried it, and I would need space and time to be able to sort of understand it and see if I could make something interesting, not that isn't gimmicky. I think technology proposes art work. It proposes a new art form. Technology creates, every time someone invents new technology, a new art form is born. So I think it's amazing and inspiring. And I'm sure there's someone right this very moment making a work of art 
that's virtual reality based. Mm. In its time, you know, it's 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 very interesting. Technology is an art form. Any others? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody.